This week on Barbell Shrug, we interview world champion powerlifter Travis Mash and talk about the lessons the barbell has taught him. Shoot for the moon, and even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Got it. I got it. Are we ready? Yep. Is there anything we need? Wait, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Are we serious? <laughs> Dude, take a quick second. I want to make sure we lock the door. I don't want anybody to come in and do a smoothie. Nope, too late. Too late. We're already coming. <laughs> lock the door. <laughs> No smoothies. And, and tell everyone to go out that way. No smoothies. Tell everyone no to go. No fucking smoothies. Everyone go fuck themselves. Smoothies Seriously. We, we don't make money from smoothies, so they can. Too bad. No, th nobody makes money off of anything. Really? All That's right. just the way you. Especially apparel in our case. Let's keep it rolling. <laughs> All right, welcome to Barbell Shrug. I'm Mike Bletzer here with my co hosts, Doug Larson and Christopher Moore. Hi, everybody. CTP behind the camera with our guest, Travis Mash. Glad world, to be here. World champion powerlifter, owner of Mash Elite Performance, where, and where we are right now, runs Mash Mafia weightlifting and powerlifting. Good job. Boom, boom, boom. You recited boom, that boom, three boom, or boom. four times. I was hoping it would come out okay. Well, I recited it three or four times in my head. I, I recited it out loud once. Hey, in all fairness to you, I really think I'm almost a professional. I really think you're getting better at this. I think you're really getting good now. He is getting better at it. <laughs> if, he does really the if he does the next part. <laughs> Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, make sure to go over to barbellshrug.com, sign up for the newsletter, and you'll learn the eight snatch mistakes that you're probably making that are keeping you from hitting giant PRs. Did that oh, work well? That's, that's all right. See? Yeah, He's like doing that. better. Awesome. Yeah. Practice. Well done, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Travis. We're here because you're awesome, pretty much. One of the strongest guys of all time. <laughs> Not to oversell you, man. I mean, <laughs> please don't let our listeners down. I don't take myself that seriously. <laughs> anymore, but it's cool. I mean, thanks. <laughs> uh, so in what, 04 and 05, you were world champion powerlifter. Yes, I was. Uh, you went to school, and we just learned that you uh, were a student of Dr. Stone. I was. Which we reference in the show every once Dr. in a while. Dr. Michael Stone, currently at Eastern Tennessee. Yeah. Eastern yeah. Tennessee State. East That's Tennessee it. State. Yeah. Him and his wife, Meg. Meg. Meg, who is the, the baddest chick Meg's cool to shit. ever live. Probably. Which, dude, she, probably. wasn't she like a capable of power cleaning like 315 and shit when her oh, prime? Yeah. She yeah. Was a, I'm not joking. The audience may think we're joking about that. That was the real thing. That's for real. She was a world class she thrower. She was a thrower. Yeah. Yes. Not a weightlifter. No. no. Mm -hmm. She could have done. I mean, I mean, she could have been a great you know, weightlifter too. Best but. conversation I ever had with Meg was that we were driving in Dr. Stone's little, um, like his Jeep. Right. You know, going back to his house. I was trying to go to school there for a while. <clears throat> She's talking about how you know useful things do. Like, he's like, yeah, at the end of your workout, and that thick Scottish action. She's like, yeah. let's do a couple of light like deadlift sets. Like, you know, maybe I would do like you know three hundred, a couple sets of five or something. Stuff <laughs> like deadlifts. That's why <laughs> oh, I used to do when I was tall. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. I can't do that shit now. Yeah, you uh, know, I realized how awesome Dr. Stone was when I first uh, went to Colorado Springs to the OTC, and they referenced him there all the time. And I'm yeah. like, boom, at App State, baby. But of course, now he's not there anymore. So. We're not so yeah. cool anymore. He went, from, he went from there to University of Edinburgh, was it? I think, to, to start exercise science. He came back to get involved in the US, U.S. scene. And then I think that's yeah. when he went to Eastern Tennessee. But for the audience, if you want to study the science of getting strong as shit, Dr. That, Stone's your man. I totally agree. I'll plug him right now. <laughs> yes, he's the man. It's hard to read any textbook or research article without seeing something he's done in the references somewhere. Just, Absolutely. Just, just PubMed, Stone, Garhammer. Right. Read, yeah. Get to reading. For real. So you, not only were you a power lifter, right? You were a weightlifter first, which I'll, is which is yes. unusual. Right. I mean, I've seen some power lifters go to weightlifting a little bit, but to see it go the other way around, why'd you do that? Well, actually, I dabbled in powerlifting. I, I played college football at App State first. Okay. Then I went into a little bit of powerlifting, where I went to actually ended up going to the junior nationals and I won. 
right away out of the gate. And then uh, back then, there was not like a thousand federations. There was like uh, oh. maybe three. But here comes someone trying to make a smoothie. So too bad. <laughs> <Is it> really? <laughs> you, you make it. Before the show, Charles like, let's We're not have smoothies. Hey, he's he's like, what the hell? Uh, no, that's, a, that's actually one of my coaches, so it's cool. Oh, okay. Yes. And so... Um, but so I started in powerlifting, and it was a very then. different scene then. Right? It was a different. It wasn't extreme. Walked it out. No equipment. Weak equipment. Super suits. Yeah. Basically, it looked like the the old school version, like uh, you know, CrossFit leotards, like right. glorified spandex you put on yourself and do your squats. Right. And so then I did that, and I went to the Junior Worlds and got a silver medal. Nice. But then, really, my my strength coach, uh, Mike Kent. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so he was awesome, and he told me, you know, I mean, I'm a five foot seven white guy. He's like, you're not gonna go to the NFL, which I already knew. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, I mean, let me be but, clear, I was not that great of a. But I have player. a dream. I, I believe in myself. He's like, too bad. He's That's like, good, son. And That's real like, good. Stop believing. <laughs> yeah. So, Stop. Get yeah. rid of your dreams. Yeah. So he told me to go to Colorado Springs, you know, and maybe try weightlifting. So um, after I went to the, the Junior Worlds and did really well, I just really packed up my car. I had $200 in my pocket. Literally, and drove to Colorado Springs, where I'd heard about Wes Barnett, the two uh, was he oh, two-time Olympian. Oh, fuck, was Wes strong, man? Oh my gosh, dude, the best thing ever, do ever in my career. Was, oh. My highlight that you were asking about was being with Wes Barnett. Oh wow! So I drove there, two hundred bucks. My mom was like, "Good luck, I'll see you in a month. There's no way you're gonna survive it." So <laughs> next day, <laughs> you got a whole lot of encouragement. a whole lot of heroes now, Travis. <laughs> so so I drove to Colorado Springs. It's probably good you got out of town. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> And then um, went straight, before I unpacked my car, I went straight to uh, the gym where he was training. It was World Gym in 8th Street, off of 8th Street in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. Went there and um, met him. He, he happened to be there. So, bef you know, before I went to my apartment or anything, I saw him. I was like, look, man, I just drove thousands of miles. You've got to train me. You know, I had to look like crazy. I drove 23 hours straight. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, no. So I was like, I bet my hair was all wild out. Young, you know? dumb, and passionate. Seriously. Yeah. You I had like, to talk to this guy on the phone before you showed up? You nope. just drove 24 hours I, for no reason? I just drove there. I just said, That's what it takes, man. Yeah. That's balls. That's what it takes. Yeah. Yeah. I just drove there, and then he was like, oh, he's like, calm down, son. I'll train you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Take it easy, man. Yeah, and then I met the, uh, the owner of the gym, and he's like, you need a job. I'm like, yes. And so the universe rewards Damn. you kindly for yeah, the risk. The pieces just fell in place. Within 30 minutes, I had my coach. I had a job, and I was off and running. What was the most impressive mm -hmm. lift uh, you hey, ever saw? I just want to say this real quick. If you show up in my gym and uh, don't call first and looking for a job, I will you're not get you're not gonna yeah. get one. I will, no I will shit it's, on your dream. It's not yeah. happening. I will shit all over your dream. You should yeah. probably just keep driving to the next town. Yeah. <laughs> just so the audience has some context, what's the most impressive thing you ever saw Wes do? Bar, but with a barbell, mm. well, you or know, one of them, you know, <laughs> he he was phenomenal with like snatch grip, um, push presses. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, like he gets snatch grip, push press, 220 kilos or more. He he, he battled Mark Henry. You guys know who that is? Yeah, Mark was. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks yeah. Mark next to Shane is like the strongest Sexual American child. to live. Yes, yes, he's legit. I mean, yeah. Mark was the strongest guy I've ever. Like Stone said, I think one time, you looked at his wrist and you realized he was just not like you. Right. His joint structure and everything. And he said that about Shane too. Shane, Shane too. hips, hips and knees weren't human hips and knees. It's totally true. But he beat Mark Henry. You know, Wes beat Mark Henry at that <laughs> movement. And I, you know, and he was a, like a was he the like a one hundred five. Uh, Kilo? 108 back then. 10, yeah, 108. Okay. So he wasn't a very huge guy. No. Like Mark was Mark was like 380 pounds or 350 pounds Maybe or something. Maybe 400. He yeah. So that's, this, and I think Wes had like ridiculous squat strength too. I mean, everything oh, yeah. was just like freaky. Oh, he's a freakish athlete. You know, whereas Mark and Shane, well, Shane's a great athlete too, but Mark Henry was just big and strong. Wes was super athletic. He could, he, you know, he was all state in Missouri and uh, actually got Mr. Basketball of the state of Missouri. Like, in, you know, so he had sco uh, college scholarships for basketball. And yeah, so, but he's like, no, I want to weight lift. Wow. Did he, did, he, uh, did he take drastic? That makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he ever I've never heard anyone say that. I don't think he ever medaled in the Olympics, but he, he took sixth. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, he was in yeah. the heat of it. Like, it's yeah. still a really heavy drug culture and international yeah. competition. He's yeah. right in the mix. Dude, you know, uh, a lot of people used to say, even the Europeans would say, he has to be taking. You know, like, I don't who, believe you. <laughs> yeah. They're like, they didn't think it was possible that a man could, at 108, could clean and jerk 220. Um, but he, I mean, he did it, but I know he wasn't like, you know, I became yeah. close friends with him and we actually talked about it. Cause you know what? I mean? Let's be serious. I came from the, the powerlifting world. And so that was a big thing. Drugs, you know, like 
It was I was used to a lot, a lot of the. It's just common. It's, it would yeah. be weird if you didn't. Do it's it. ubiquitous and ever right. present. So, but with um, you know, with with Wes, I was like, you know, have you ever even considered? And he's like, he's like, you know, I'm not gonna lie. You know, I've thought about it because obviously he would have medaled if not, you know, gold medaled. And he's like, but all these young kids that look up to me, he's like, if I take that, I won't be able to look them in the eye and, and say, say work hard. You know, right. So, well, not that those guys aren't working really hard, but like it's you, you're, right. you're dealing with kids to, to be doing that and know it and then tell them something else. Right. If you can live with it, good for you. But I would never do that. I mean, right. Me too. And I know. I know Kendrick must share that same frustration now because Kendrick's another guy. He's like, I, I tell him, I told him at the party we were at the, that couple months ago. Like, you, you're fucking strong, man. He's frustrated to know that if you were on the same playing field, wink, wink, with these dudes, <laughs> you just fucking beat all their asses. Yeah. You know, it's probably true. He would just crush them, probably. I mean, he would just think so, yeah. man. I don't know about crush them, but well, he, he'd, he'd be right in the mix. Yeah. So I'm getting a little excited. I like, I like Kendrick so much, and I believe in him. Right, me too. But he yeah. would be right in the mix, man. Yes. He would definitely 100% medal. Seeing him, see oh, him yeah. squat and lift, I'm like, yeah, you would be there. Yes. And that's, that sucks, because he's, he's giving it all he's got. He, you know, it's not, it's a, it's a fairest thing in the world, but it is what it is. I'm happy that we have guys who are getting there anyway, despite right. that huge disadvantage. They're getting there anyway. What is his top, what is his top place in, in the Olympics? Does anybody know? Eighth, eighth, I think. Eighth, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah so he's, 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 he's right 85. there in that pocket. You so know? he's moving up to 94 now, so right. I'm, I'm interested. I think if he can get his snatch up, yeah, that'll yeah. be that'll be a game changer for him. If he had a John North snatch with that cleaning jerk, Exactly. You know, now you have a battle right there. Strength wise, though, he's not he's not inferior to anybody in the world in his weight class. I don't think. Without no, a doubt. Damn. Like, yeah. Like when you put like say John versus Kendrick, just being strong, like there's no there's no match. Well, when you so Kendrick's John. one of those guys. When you, when you when you look at Kendrick, you're like that guy's not built like a normal human being. No. no Genetically, he, like, he goes up a weight class. Yeah. And he's shredded. It's like shredded. who goes up a weight class yeah. and then like as soon as they. They hit that next weight class. You can still see their abs or their singles. I know. You know what I love about Kim? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. And Jared, you know that crew. Pancakes. In Louisiana State. You know, or, I mean Shreveport. <laughs> yeah. They're jacked. Under, you know, they do under, a lot of strength training. Under Dr. Kyle, man, a yeah. stone, a stone student. Yeah. Now yeah. This, shout out to Stone, man. This is a sh- is this the Stone Show or what? <laughs> well, it should be. It. We need to get him on the show eventually. We can Dude. easily make that happen. We could probably make that happen. Oh, he's really cool. All right, yeah. mark your calendars, folks. I guess we're, we're committing to that kind of. <laughs> East Tennessee State, yes. Yeah. Another road trip. <laughs> East Tennessee State is awesome little community. Have you guys been there at Johnson City? Yeah. been there a couple mm-hmm. times. Yeah. The uh, competition not too Univers- long ago. He's yeah. got a whole complex there. Yeah, University Nationals was there this past year. And, uh, we had some athletes go. It was, it was a great time. It was a great meet. Yeah, yeah I actually got to interview Kendrick Ferris while we were there. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. For the very first time, it was cool. We had we were up in the stadium. We had like all the weightlifting going on down below us in the background. So. For, for context, ne- next 55? to at that university, episode what? Fifty-five. Episode fifty-five. At that university, next to the medical school, I think Dr. Stone's department and his resource is the biggest department in that whole school. It's unbelievable. I mean, I'm so jealous for young students who want to learn weightlifting, yeah. want to learn exercise oh, science. Yeah. You should go there. Right. Just go. Do what do what Trav did. Pack your fucking shitty little Buick. And just say, Dr. Take two hundred bucks. Yeah. Tell your mom, thanks for shitting on my dreams, and get out of here. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> yeah, for, yeah, for real. So I remember calling my I'm mom. Sure, your mom was a nice lady. Sorry, no, she's super nice. But I mean, think about it. Like, what are the odds of a guy taking two hundred bucks and surviving in Colorado Springs? You know, thousands of miles away from North Carolina, where they're from. You know. Yeah. So I mean, in her. In her defense, I, I was on the flip side realistic. of that. You were showing what people need to realize. What I'm only now learning it, coming up on age of 33, and you guys all agree now. Like uh, the fear and the, the perceived risk on the on the forefront. If you're feeling that, if you're a young lifter who's like, should I right. pull the trigger on this? Like the risk is actually way lower than you think. It Just really jump is. on the other side of the fence, get out there, be smart, educate yourself, but go for it, man. Yeah. Nothing, nothing wrong is going to happen. Yeah, you know, just go for you it. You just what have it? to leave everything behind. I think that. Yeah, I mean, it's actually not that big of a deal. So, is that really not? Is that why you're buying an Airstream? <laughs> Are you pulling a Matt Chan soon? Yeah, yeah. No, but I, I, I'm a big fan of like, what's going on here? I have no idea. It sounds like there's a thunderstorm rolling. It in. does. It sounds like, it sounds like it all of a sudden got now. windy. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Was that an earthquake? I think I think we just experienced the first North Carolina if it happens, earthquake. Tell me. We had a big earthquake last year. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, we really did. Oh, I mean, really? Big ish. Like it shook the house. Oh then, wow! Yeah, no idea. Yeah, it was crazy. Is there an earthquake going on, or have I had too many fingers of scotch? I can't tell anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't think it's that big of it. You know, I think uh, every young person should get out of their hometown. Uh, you know, I did it. I went in the navy. Yeah. Uh, 
Doug, and look how you turned out. I turned out just fine. Seriously. Some people, some people weird, may argue. A little weird. A little, yeah, a little weird, weird. But good. I mean, you, uh, you pay your bills on time. Yeah, but I think I think uh, if you just pick up and go, you yeah. know, it can change your life for the better. You don't know who you are until you leave town. What do you have to lose, really? So it doesn't work out. Go back home. And that, yeah, and if you, a big deal. And if you wake up one day and you find yourself like, wow, I'm feeling really optimistic. Like I believe in myself. Good for you, first of all. And if you find yourself going... <laughs> All my friends and family seem to be really shitting on me right now. Like they don't yeah. really feel like they want me to succeed at this. You gotta be willing to say, you know, I'm moving on to greener pastures. I, I totally agree. Not leaving your family yeah. behind, but you gotta surround yourself with people who go, you know, you can be a great fucking lifter. You can be a great businessman. You can be a great anything. Well, most, Come most hang out with us. Most eighteen-year-olds don't have somebody depending on them, and that's the right. perfect time to, you know, take go your find chance. The, go find the people yeah. who you want to be like right. at that one time. Just go to them and learn from them. That's Immerse yourself in. Them. How long were you in uh, Colorado Springs? About uh, three years the first time, you know. My, I was, I spent about a year and a half under Wes, and then uh, I was invited to Olympic Training Center by Dragomir, and then my father got uh, lung cancer, mm. and so I moved oh, home. Man. Yeah, and so it was terminal, and so I, wa- you know, I wanted to be with him, and so, you know, you know, that's the only could have should have in my life. I can honestly say I will die with no could have or should have, but that one. But really, it's a could have or should have that I'm okay with because you know, my dad and I spent those last few months of his life communicating for the first time openly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like there was no bull crap between us. It was just, here's the way I feel. Here's the way he felt. You know, my, you know my, my mother was married three times. And so, you know, I think there was a lot of, you know, I had certain stepdads come into my life that were, you know, had lots of money and they're very influential. And my dad was just a blue collar, hardworking dude. So I think there was times where I might have been intrigued by these new guys more. Right. And it might have hurt my dad's feelings. But then I just wanted to tell him, that, the hardest thing, guys, it took me months to say, look, dad, I love you. You were the best dad in the world, and none of these dudes mattered at all. Man, yeah. you, you're actually hitting home pretty close because my, my dad passed away on Thanksgiving. Oh, and I man. didn't really get that. Yeah. What, <clears throat> it's weird that once you're, for all those people listening, if you got your parents who are, if you kind of know there's not much time, you got to have that moment with them. Because I didn't get that. I mean, my dad was like, you're a hardworking dude. Yeah. So, like, li- he actually lived what... What most people, if you call yourself a Christian, he's actually doing it. He's stripped down, right. bare bones. He's living My like too. he's living like a like a like a Zen Hobbit. Right. Uh, but I, he always <laughs> Zen Hobbit. Zen, Zen, to say. Zen Hobbit. hold on, Zen Hermit. Hermit. <laughs> I, like the, I, like, I like Zen Hobbit better. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Somebody's yeah. gonna make that a hashtag. Sorry, whatever. I, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but anyway, like, like he's always being the role of dad. Like right. I gotta do my best for my kids. So he never opened up the emotion and his fears and what he was Same. missing and wanting. Yeah. And I only saw that after he was gone, unfortunately. So yeah. I, I got to go through the pages of my mom. Then goes, oh, like, you know, we had all these hopes, fears, and wishes, and dreams and stuff. And I go, fuck. You know, you want that conversation. So if you I got know. that, you, it, it was yeah. worth that, dude. It For was. real. That's priceless. You know, the Olympics, I mean, obviously, a lot of people that are doing weightlifting, you know, that seems like the pinnacle of your life would be the Olympics. But getting to say that to your dad to me was the pinnacle. You know, being able to say you did your job. And so he could go out thinking, smiling, you know. Cool. I, he goes I was out great, smiling about he, he was a great dad. I look back, I used to think, and, th- and here's something for your listeners to think about. My dad was real chill. He would go work his job come home cut wood do whatever around the house but live a super chill life you know and never had any worries no stress and I used to think you know I used to think why aren't you more aggressive like my mother is yeah. very aggressive owns her own business you know all Guess, the, is that why they worked <laughs> they bounced well, they didn't work see that's it <laughs> oh shit yeah, no, yeah, dude yeah. How, how bad is my memory yeah <laughs> you just said that all before. five minutes ago yeah. I, had break, I had to break up the intense moment with a with a weird off put yeah my mom needed you know she's very A type and the dudes that she was you know more found more appealing were, were you know, like big time entrepreneurs. And mm-hmm. so my dad was nothing like that. Mm-hmm. So the poor guy mm-hmm. never had a shot with my mother, you know? And so, but I look back and I think, you know, who had it right and who had it's it It's called wrong. silent, bro. Sorry, bro. You got in <laughs> trouble. You got in trouble. So, <laughs> so even when, you know, and I'm very A-type, obviously. So even in this life of A-type, go, 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 there should be times we all should find for defragging, as you said, Mike. Yeah. So. There Not unfragging. Not, not on this show. Previous conversation. Travis and I met a couple no. weeks ago at the American Open. We had some really nice, deep <laughs> conversations at the party that night. Talked about defragging. Right. Kind of taking time yourself to to get all the stuff in your life behind you so that you can move forward. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we used to have a lot of meetings here, at, you know, where people shoot out a thousand ideas. And, and that was the most unproductive thing ever. 
because we never would stop to say, all right, let's pick these and attack them, you know. And so yeah. we never defragged. But now we've we've kind of like roped that in. And so now we pick something, we target it and conquer it and then move forward. But they say less is more. Who is they? They, they do say that. Who is they? Uh, <laughs> speaking of speaking of less is more. So in, in, all, in all your years of experience, yeah. like what were like like the one or two key things that like really led to your success? Where for the, all the people that are brand new to training that really need to focus on just a few things, like what suggestions would you give those people? Oh, it would be easy. It would be like finding the right group to train with. You know, oh, yeah. no matter what, whether it's weightlifting or powerlifting, like uh, finding the right group and like you know not being afraid to go train with people that are going to beat you. But, you know, what I did is I targeted those people. Like in North Carolina, when I came back to powerlifting, I would target people like there was a guy named Grant Pitts. He was this super heavy oh, guy. You know God, what I'm talking about? fucking huge. Huge. Like huge. 25 inch, not, not fat real. arms. Like beast. Yeah. Wow. So I would literally go train with him. He was a jerk too. And like, but, <laughs> but, but I was, you know, like, and I was a rookie at that time because I'd moved back to, you know, to North Carolina. Mm-hmm. So there was not a lot of weightlifting and there was no, there wasn't CrossFit. And so you didn't have all these opportunities. You guys who go to CrossFit consider yourself lucky because, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't have those opportunities. So I started powerlifting. Any gym you can squat, bench, and deadlift. So, I would seek this guy, I, you know, Grant Pitts out. Mm-hmm. He was such a jerk, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to put up with his mouth until I can beat him. And so there came a time where I could beat him, and then I was done with his mouth, you know. Well, yeah. He, he, who was his coach? He trained under that guy. He used, they used to have articles in Power the USA all the time. Oh, yeah. Um, Tamara Grimwood. Her Grimwood. husband. Yeah. Grimwood. She, she died. I think she killed herself, but. Oh, oh shit. Yeah. They were crazy. The whole crew was crazy. Yeah, and I had to put up with that dude. The cocktails weren't, ha- weren't weren't helping the situation, probably. No, because Grant was. I'm, I, you don't look at a guy like Grant Pitts and go, for, "Google it, folks." You don't look at that guy and go, "Man, he takes all his fish oil, doesn't he?" No. <laughs> so fuck, that doesn't come no. to your mind, man. No, dude. So for the sake of, let me make two point one. What were your best lifts? Just so, I don't think we mentioned that in powerlifting. Well, in, in powerlifting, you had I had a in competition nine seventy squat. Um, seven oh four bench and an eight oh four deadlift. Uh, for some reason, I don't, I don't well, think body I, weight at a two twenty, uh, right? Two twenty, two twenty. Oh, I don't shit. think your bench was that high. Yeah. yeah so that's, do you know anyone that's two hundred twenty pounds that lifts that much weight? Ed Cohen. No. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no, 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 I'm talking about people at home, like oh, no. in their like home gym. Your buddy. Your yeah, buddy doesn't do your that. Your buddy no. doesn't do that shit. I want to make that point because, like, here's why you should also take this advice really close to heart because it's a good lift to tell on you. My, my second point was, do you think? To that point about getting to where the good lifters are, wouldn't you agree? I'm, I'm kind of begging the question a yeah. bit, but do you think that's, that was way more important than any specific program you oh, pursued? Yeah. The belief is really where it's at. Like, yeah. Don't people overvalue programming? Yes. And you know, my programming was simple, simply go heavy all the time. That's all I did. You know, yeah. I would say I was West Side, but at the end of the day, I never did a true dynamic workout. It was always, you know, I would do the, you know, the speed bench with the bands, and I'd always be like, Put more weight on. Put yeah. more weight. Until uh, I was maxing uh, out with bands. Aren't I a power lifter? <laughs> aren't I a power lifter who's lifting heavy? Or? But uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. But I say it's not necessarily sustainable. But if you want that, you want to go beyond yourself and reach new mm-hmm. heights. You got to be where those people are. That's all. And this by osmosis, you rise to a level. Right. You can't yeah. keep it up for long, maybe. But you can. That's how you get there. A big piece of what I did too is I would write over 100 different goals that I planned on breaking during the training cycle. And I, it was, I was OCD. And so I realized. Way to prioritize. Yeah, I know. So much for less is more. And so I don't do this. I'm not good. So, but let yeah. me give you an example. Like, you know, max off a three board, max off a two board, you know, like mm. the chain squat. Like I mean, all kinds of extra, all yeah. kind of special exercise. I definitely oh, okay. believe in that with, with Louis. And then, so mm. I realized if I would break 70% of those, I would be unbeatable, you know? And mm. it was true. That I mean, so that little, I don't know if anyone else has ever done that, but. Like I, I really, if I broke most of those goals mm-hmm. at that point in my life, there was no way, no one could beat me. You're trying to break one of those once a week. How how did that work? All the time. So that's why dynamic, you know, mm. dynamic days never ended up dynamic. Because you're always trying to break it a record that on your dynamic me. days. It got that way for me too. Man. I got to where I yeah. would do like a heavy squat or whatever on day one, and uh, I realized that you get good results just by. Squ- Squatting heavier more often. I squat it's so funny, man. And I slowly took off all the bands. You know, yeah. I only use bands occasionally because I think really the only mm-hmm. benefit to them is that they make things fun. It's a fun change if that you're tired all. of squatting. That you is pick, a, you pick up a textbook and you know you got. I mean, I I, I do the, I overthink program design yeah, myself all the time, and mm-hmm. I mean I, I think that's a thing, and. You know, the, when we talk to the best athletes right. in the world, yeah. they may be doing dynamic days, but they're not 
they're not thinking. They're not overthinking the dynamic day. Well, everything, not, should, yeah. everything with a barbell. They're not over analyzing. Yeah. It's it's interesting. I feel, like, I feel like people swing back and forth between programming doesn't really matter when it, when they're first starting to it matters a lot. It's the to only back, thing. Back to it yeah. doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the, I, yeah. that's my my experience. Like that every every good lifter. It's a pendulum. That, no, every lifter. Not, pendulum. Not good, but right. The pendulum is swinging. Always swinging. Right. Getting pr- programming is what you need to. It goes do. The you same, just need man. to work hard and just. Maybe it's the same yeah. when everybody's life peered across the board. Like, there's this acceleration, and you think, I need more and more and more and more. And you get yeah. some of this stuff, and you realize, well, fuck. I need less, less, less. I either less. go on yeah. with, with this or I go backwards. And you go backwards, you realize, okay, back to the starting point. That's where I wanted to be. And then and I was smiling face. The philosopher over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so For sure. I totally, you know, I totally agree with that. You know, when we just started just getting bare bones, just mm. lifting heavy, I mean, that's what worked. So, so then, what, what would a typical day in the gym look like for you? Uh, powerlifting or weightlifting? Uh, let's do both. All powerlifting right. first. Powerlifting would be, you know, a typical day. Like a squat day would be, you know, I would do use bands. But at the end of it, it would end up maxing out either with bands or I'd take the bands off. Mm. So I would do the speed stuff. Were you, were you box squatting or? No. No. No, I did box squatting one, you know, one or like a couple times. Mm. And ended up, of my entire career, the only thing that ever hurt my back was box squats. Oh, really? Really? So. I mean, it wasn't for you. It wasn't for me. I'm not. Yeah, obviously, I'm a Louis F- Simmons fan, so I'm not knocking Louis. As we are too. Yeah. yeah. Were you well, trying to get a lot of variety, do, like different band tension every day, different bars, di- yes. different different width different stances. Bars. Yeah, but the closer the meat uh, came, the the more specific I would be. Like mm-hmm. the then it would be a squat bar. Did you learn that in school? No. <laughs> <laughs> the school no. of hard knocks, man. Yeah, in school, I learned like basics. And Anat- I mean, anatomy and kinesiology is about all I really apply. You know, sure. But, mm-hmm. You know, otherwise I learned uh, from traveling, to meeting these people, like you guys mm-hmm. do, like traveling to Louis. It's Simmons. the best educational model, man. Yes. I didn't learn shit about lifting in school. No, you, you not about the actual lifting part of it. Because no. you can't. Right. I mean, what's a, yeah. what's a two hundred pound washed up guy? Just, all he does is talk about training. Hasn't really trained them. To, I'm being a little aggressive. I'm sorry, but in the classroom, <laughs> man, there was never really anything that I could take out and really. Could, the exception would be uh, when I went to school with guys like Brian Schilling and, and Dr. Lauren Chu. Yeah, but these guys were training for weightlifting full speed and researching all the shit. Now that's yeah. that's perfect right there. Yeah, that's no, a good combination. That's rare. So Most of the time, it's a guy who's like, "Don't lift so much." Like, also, what's really important is endurance training. Like, oh fuck this guy. Yeah, n- n- <laughs> none of that. None of the learning happened in class, though. It was it was training, doing actual weightlifting right. with Schilling that that really slingshotted us forward. Yeah, I learned about weightlifting at school, just not in a classroom. But after and school's like, over. Yeah, at school. like when yeah, when the classes were over, we all met up and trained with Schilling. Yeah, Schilling. we were doing yeah. things like we'd all train like at three, four, five, whatever it was. Work in a lab all morning, take a break, train, work in a lab all evening. But like right. we're in there, like you do a lift, stop. Talk research, talk science, talk real application of some study you're thinking, and go. Oh yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe that works, and go back to lifting hard. Like it was really integrated in everything you were doing. Right. All right. So we didn't we didn't actually get a day in the. In I the, know, yeah. Damn. We got to we gotta get off, back off track. So like yeah, a, you know a squat day, and then we you know I I would end up with um, reverse hypers, mm-hmm. um, glute hands. I did a lot of posterior chain work. Mm-hmm. I still do my weight my weight lifters. Uh, do we have several glute hams in there and so but um and then i would do a lot of single leg work too just to you know i didn't want to get any imbalances so i would do mm-hmm. you know lunges or like you know rear leg elevated you know squats it took me years to mm-hmm. find the value in single leg work it's boring man. it's, it's only yeah, after yeah. repeated injuries it's like oh yeah, it's a break from the bar that's though. a good idea <laughs> let's, let's try not to get hurt so yeah mm-hmm. and then a bench day would be like uh on a dynamic day, it would start with bands, mm-hmm. you know, you know, speed, like a minute between sets, working up heavy, mm-hmm. you know, on a max ever day, it would be like, a lot, I do use a lot of boards on bench. Mm-hmm. I will say that, but I always yeah. ended up with a rep to my chest heavy. Mm-hmm. So I never just did a two board or a three board. It always ended up being a full rep. You feel like that saved your shoulders over time? Yeah. You know, um, using the boards, I don't know. No, no, no really? I think, I, I think, uh, you know, no, I think full range of motion is actually better for you. Mm-hmm. I think what really ended up hurting my shoulders was doing the crazy bands. You know, that was the one thing in my yeah, career man. I wish I would have chilled out on. Mm-hmm. You did a lot yeah. of crazy bands? Oh, man. <laughs> I went up, this is a true story. You're going to start selling them like, like that. Crazy bands. <laughs> green bands. <laughs> I would double a green band and do ba- a real green band, not a mean. Yeah, an average band. Yeah. yeah. You would double do, that over the bench. I would double it and then do benches with that. And it was insane. Shit. The most I ever did. How much tension is that like with no it's weight on much. the bar? Like, I'm I used to be a couple that. hundred pounds. <laughs> well, I, yeah, to, I would do no. my board presses with... Um, Maybe like 200 to 300 pounds in the bar, and I would use a light band doubled. Right. And that was like, that was like an extra 250 pounds of band tension. Yeah. 
and it's really extreme because you take that thing off. Now you're taking the exercise. Yeah, yeah. You're taking the one exercise you can die on and making it four times as deadly. Because now it's a yeah. fucking guillotine. Yeah, seriously. Pay yeah. attention guillotine yeah. with all this weight in your hand. You can die. Yeah. yeah, that would be the one. Even though it skyrocketed my bench, it did do that. It shot it up. But looking back, I could have like. I, you know, I think we all have genetic potential, and you're going to reach it. It's how quick you reach it. So right. I could have still reached that potential without mm. getting hurt if I would have just been more patient and not. Uh, and the not patience sick. game. Yeah. Nobody has it. I, I don't have it at all. So all what right. about uh, what about weightlifting? What did your weightlifting workouts look like? At the, you know, in Colorado. And how long were you at the? How long were you in Colorado Springs doing that before you transitioned to power? Not lifting? even quite a year because I had to, uh, you know, maybe a year at the. OTC. So you didn't weightlift very long. No, I only weightlifted, you know, from, um, let's see, like the end of 1996 to like 1999, you know, like right before they really started training for 2000. But Okay. So, yeah, and then I moved back. So, but a typical day of weightlifting would be, you know, we did, we did a lot of percentage work back then. There was not, we didn't do Bulgarian right. very much. Mm. And so, um, but we would squat heavy, you know, we did, there was a lot more um, assistance work, I think, than they do necessarily, it seemed like nowadays, or like with, say, Glenn Finlay. You know, we did right. lots of pull. We did pull. It depends. On, yeah, it depends on what school you're at. What, who's your coach? Right. Some coaches are, you know, very Bulgarianish, right. and there's definitely some coaches that are very Russian. I would be more. I would lean towards like what Kyle, did, you know, like at Streetport. They do lots of like strength training. It's almost it's almost bodybuilderish over there. It really is. Yeah. And those dudes mm-hmm. look it, but they look cool too. Let's be serious. When you're at the beach, <laughs> you want to look cool, right? Yeah, I wish uh, I would have done more of Pierce's program when I was younger. Yeah. I would be much more jacked today. I'm yeah. sure of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, like John. John just looks like a good athlete, you know. But yeah. When, you, when yeah. you look at Kim, oh, yeah. you're like, wow. That brick like beast. You look at him mm-hmm. and go, brick shit house. Right. <laughs> brick Absolutely. fucking shit house. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, it would just be like, like we did lots of assistance, and then when the, we, we when we were within six weeks of a competition that was like called the red zone by Jagger Mir, mm-hmm. and then we were given the green light at any time to go heavy. So just anytime cool. you felt good, just yeah. go for it. Just anytime, oh, just wow. to dial in your nervous system and, and hit. Yeah. And certain people <clears throat> would use that, and certain people wouldn't. Like Pete Kelly, you know, mm-hmm. the Olympian, mm-hmm. he would always stick to the percentages to the T. Shane Hammonds would normally stick to the percentages mm-hmm. to the T. And I was an idiot, and I would always, <laughs> I would like red zone to me meant max out every day, whether I felt it or not. You right. know, and so I think the ones who stuck to the percentages um, more closely did better. So did you ever okay. train with Shane? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's who was there. I was with Shane. Yeah, he was there. I guess. Yeah. You podcasted with him the other yeah, day. Yeah, we podcasted yeah. with him. Yeah, like Shane was yeah, so If you don't amazing. know, Travis Smash uh, is on with John North on the uh, Weightlifting Talk. talk. So yeah. if yeah, you want to hear more of Travis, go to Weightlifting Talk. Yes. So. You all had Shane Hammond on the other day? We did. Is that what you said? Yeah. So we're friends because cool. you know, we powerlifted. You didn't know when I told you I powerlifted first. We powerlifted together. You know, oh, really? Back, yeah, he was a beast. He so you powerlifted with him and then went and did weightlifting and then went, came back? He, yeah. yeah. His record okay. still might. His junior IPF record may still stand. I'm sure. 1,008. 1,008 or 1,013 or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was 1,008. 1,008. Junior, it, yeah. junior squat, right? Junior super heavy squat. Yes. Uh Single was it single ply or was that single ply man? Single and ply briefs, high bar, U- US. It was no briefs, no briefs. Right? Single yeah, yeah. ply suit that he was not even tight. He could put his own straps. On. I saw it. I'm not yeah, even, there's there's no doubt about his strength. So then, yeah. what's really impressed about him, man? I just somebody posted his highlight reel. Like somebody made a, a video of his best lifts in like from 2004 to maybe two two to four in that range. Mm-hmm. Dude, he was doing easy cleaning jerks like 250. Yeah. Or at least in training. Like he was doing good. He was so close. To spend all that time weightlifting and to be such an athlete to make a – or powerlifting and make a good run at weightlifting, get close to actually, mm. like, making a run at, like, qu- like, you know, getting in a top five or something or top ten. He was close. He got seventh. You know, it was his highest. But I think if he, if he could have – we could have started a guy like, you know, Shane early. Mm-hmm. You've, got, oh, you've got a medalist. That's your Rezaza day. Yeah. U.S. Rezaza day. Oh, yeah. You've got a medalist. I mean, a guy like him doesn't need steroids to be strong. He is strong. Period. He and could dunk explored. a basketball too, right? Five foot nine, I think he is five foot nine or ten, oh. three hundred and eighty pounds. I didn't realize he yeah. wasn't that tall. He's not like I, I no, feel he, like I feel like when I look at him he's on, round, on, man. on my he was, on right. my computer, I was like, Oh, that guy's gotta be bigger. Round, yeah, I, I, I heard, the first time I saw him at the Arnold, he walked by me and he just walks by like this tall and I was like, Holy shit, he's he, he, he looks way bigger on on film, yeah, because they're yeah. usually the cameras down here in the stage. By the way, I, I would, and I want yeah. to say round. That's in, that's in Derek. He was, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that guy fat. I mean, no. you look at his legs. You're like, no. his legs are, and from a muscular perspective, as wide as they are tall. Yeah, it seems. <laughs> his you, fucking quadriceps looked like 
looked like the, the a basketball. Uh, it, he looked he looked like <laughs> a little bit of a chubbier version of that uh, that cow they fucked with its genetics to make oh, the, yeah. the myostatin <laughs> gene down regulator, whatever, upright, yeah. whatever it is. He looks like mm. that. He looked like that. I want to know when they're going to get that for me. I want that. I want them to fuck with that myostatin gene. It'll be wasted yeah. on you. Would you, you it would be wasted. <laughs> would you volunteer for that study? No. no. Not now. Maybe 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ten, 10 years ago, I would have done anything. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, yeah, did you guys you, hear you blow a dude for gas money 10 years ago, wouldn't yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> so, did you all hear the story? He was talking, Shane. He made me feel so... Inf- no, Not many people on earth. It made me feel so inferior as Shane mm. Hammonds was talking about doing it was seven, 793 pounds mm. he did it 10 times back squat oh, yeah. he said, oh he said it felt so easy he felt like I keep going maybe 20 times I'm like, oh, what? Holy shit. what the fuck are you talking about yeah uh, the only thing more impressive than that maybe is what uh, just recently happened the Russian who who got caught on death but he, he took a raw squat attempt at like a thousand three a nice. melon chef or whatever nice. Whoa. Whoa! Yeah, a raw, a raw Whoa. Belt, belt knee wraps. He Talk took about my stack. Jeez. And look, he 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 goes down, bounces, and shoots up. What? And I, I go, you could have just yeah. taken that one inch deeper and gotten three whites, a raw one thousand pound squat. Which maybe Shane could have done that too in his prime. But you're talking about strength that is. You're talking about like, like Hercules shit. Yeah, these dudes are like. I think Shane could have easily taken. You know, in, in his prime. Remember, he was a 23 year old kid, and so mm-hmm. true strength doesn't you know tap out till way after that. Mm-hmm. Literally, I was at my strongest till I was in my 30s. So if he could have gone back in his 30s and just went for you know powerlifting, you're talking about easily over a thousand pounds. How squat. old were you when you peaked on your strength? I was 33. All right, so I, one more year. Yeah. And I can. <laughs> but then it was a steep decline. Like I was, yeah. you know, 33, I was set. And by 35 and a half or 36, it was a huge cliff. Well, damn. Now yeah. you're making me. Oh, now, shit. Now. We're staring down the cliff, Travis. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Two more like, years and I'm done. It's like, a ro- it's like a steepest roller coaster of your life, man. You go, oh, I'm so strong. Nope. All right, interview's over. All right, so uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm Making thoroughly depressed. Bad. Yeah. No, no wasn't. Uh, uh, let's, take a, let's take a break real quick. When we come back, Travis is going to tell you about how, what the bar taught him about life. Perfect. <laughs> Beautiful ending. Hey, guys, I'm Mike Bledsoe from the Barbell Shark Podcast. Today's technique wad, we're going to be going over uh, banded squats and specialty bars. The reason we're doing this is because we did a, uh, a podcast for, on uh, powerlifting squats for CrossFitters. And in that episode, we went into a lot of uh, discussion about why they'd be good for different people and stuff like that. Uh, so we decided to put this technique wad together so that you can try to apply some of these principles at home. Chris Ford, take it away. All right. So we have a standard, uh, this is a West Side style old school pack, very simple. We have a standard barbell, Olympic barbell on the rack, just to show you what your typical setup might be like. Uh, the key thing for bands is that you have to have an anchor point. Uh, on this rack, quite handily, I've got just a metal bar, this bottom support bar goes across. This forms a good surface for attaching bands. So on, on the simplest possible way, you just simply loop a band around, choke it through. Don't pull it too tight, don't leave it too loose. Just let it fall naturally. That'll probably give you a consistent loop size. And then just for attaching over the bar, now, you probably want to be careful in that you don't put the band over this side of the barbell and let it pull the other side up. If the band is really tight, uh, it could do that, so just express some caution. So what I usually do to get it over, I reach down and grab to leave the top a little loose so I get good. If you do this, it's kind of hard to get up here and this is hard to stretch. So choke down on it a little bit, pull it up, slap it right over, and then you can just adjust it down. So it's right against the collar. You don't want to put it over the collar because for obvious reasons that band could get pinched and it'll fray and tear and then in the middle of a squat set it'll pop and you're going to get hurt really bad. (laughs) So when you hook it up like this, you get a nice amount of tension. If you want this band tighter, which you need to be careful of, but you can tighten it by attaching it close to the floor. So if you had uh, dumbbells will probably have it close to the floor. We'll show you that in a minute. You can also attach it straight to the floor if you use hooks, and that'll stretch the band farther and choke it. Uh, if this is too loose for you, you can also just take one end of the band. If I back this up a little bit, you can stretch one side and choke the other side over. Get it lined up nice and good, and that creates a little more stretch. Um, but really, when I'm doing sets now, uh, I think 
tension like this is plenty. This may be 100, 120 pounds, maybe on the bar. That's plenty for my needs. Which, if you watch the show, you'll talk. You'll see we talk about just having enough to where you feel a difference. The disadvantage of making these too tight uh, is that it could start changing the bar path and it can start messing with your form a little bit. So if you leave them just a little bit loose, so we just have a modest amount, it'll give you effect and it won't change your form. I think also uh, you want to make sure that there's some tension on the band at the bottom of the squat as well. Yeah. So I, I've played around with doing some uh, banded squats that aren't to a box. Uh, for weightlifters where they're getting really, really deep. In that case, they have more potential to get slack in the line yeah. at the bottom. So what I have to do is I have to double up at the bottom or double up at the top like Chris was saying. I, I'm more likely to, to double something up at the bottom. Um, depending on what you're hooking to, it's, it, it can be, with a dumbbell it might be hard to double up. With a, if, you're, if you're attaching to, say, the upright, the rogue um, safety, um, what are those called? Little safety things that pop on. Yeah. I, yeah. I like to use those and I'll, I can loop that around as many times as I need to get the proper tension. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, what I don't want is I don't want to get slack in the line at the bottom. Yeah, it shouldn't, and then, be, boing, it shouldn't flop out. around. You should see it stay just taut. Now, to, to Mike's point, if you want to go deeper and have the band tension at the bottom, use a smaller band, like a mini band. That way it's tight at the bottom. And when you stretch it all the way to the top, if you're doing a high bar squat, it's not overly tight at the top. I'd make that point. <clears throat> so what I like to do, if I want to add more tension, I'll just loop a second smaller band around. So this may give you, it's maybe 15, 20 pounds, maybe 30 pounds, I don't know. It's not a ton. And you just toss it over. And that gives you just an extra bit. So this doesn't create too much tension at the top. This adds a little bit. So it's better than just keeping on choking down on the same one. So I think once you have your, well, we want to show how we hook it up to a kettlebell or something just for a change. Yeah. If you don't have a rack like this, you have some heavy kettlebell or a dumbbell, the same thing. Choke it through and attach. Now the disadvantage, that handle's a little high. So we just put this down, wrap it around again, pull it through, and now it's a little bit tight. Same thing, line it up just like that, put it over. Uh, let me make one more point about the usage. Yeah, so a quick point about where you hook it up. You see, I have that band uh, choked just a little bit behind the main part of the rack, so you don't want it choked too far up, because then if you step back, the band will be angled uh, forward. If you have it too far back, when you take your step back, you'll be squatting, and the band will be angled, angled back. So what you want to do, and usually when you squat, you just want to take one step out of the rack. Don't be this guy who picks the bar up and walks back five steps. That's not necessary. Pick the bar up, take one step back, and stay in the squat. So wherever that step back is, that's where you want that band to be anchored. And for me, I like right in front of my ankle, this point where the force is put through the floor, I like that to be lined up right where that band is pivoting. So put one foot under the bar. Put one foot where you want it, unrack, and then just pop that left foot back or whatever foot's in front. That way you won't overstep, you won't understep. The last thing you want to do is squat with that band pulling forward or back because it's going to throw your form off. We don't want our form thrown off. Um, you'll notice that we switched the bar very cleverly. We took that straight bar out, and now what I've done is I put it in my safety squat bar. This bar is very interesting. We have this yoke. It's padded, so the bar is going to be held a little high up off your shoulders, kind of like a high bar squat. The difference with a high bar squat is actually it's up and the weight is a little bit forward. So it's kind of like a mix between a high bar back squat and a front squat. So if you look, CTP, you can tell that when this bar is in the rack, the angle, get it from the side, the angle of this bracket is a little forward. So what's going to happen is, this is straight down. When you pick it up, it's going to be like this. You see how it ro rotates forward? And you see how that band is now pulling it back down? What happens is when you put this bar out of the rack, and you walk back, you are trying to hold it like this, but the bar is trying to rotate forward. So what it's going to do, it's going to try to fold over your thoracic spine. Your job is to arch back up into it and hold that position as you squat. What's going to happen is you take that band off, it's going to be really easy to hold that upright position. So it's a good way to train your extension. The mechanics of the bar, uh, or one thing. The other thing is that this bar can help you keep training if you have a couple of specific issues. One, if your shoulder is bothering you, if you got really bad shoulder tendonitis, 
uh, any other kind of problem we show it's, it's affecting the way you grab a bar. Uh, the advantage of this bar is you pick it up, the, the weight sits controlled on your, your shoulders, it's not going to go anywhere. And you can come from this, you know, pinned position under a straight barbell, uh, and you can put your hands here and take all the pressure off. So if you've got something that needs to heal, if you've got a shoulder injury, if you had a surgery, if you got a mobility issue, you could keep training the squat in a very effective way. Also, if you're like me and you struggle with a front rack position, a pal that played football for years and years, have an elbow issue, got mobility issues that are going to be hard to work around. Um, you can get that front squat effect with this a bar. It's not quite as good as a front squat. But like I said, the bar is higher. It's a little more in front. It's trying to round you. So if for whatever reason you can't comfortably do a front squat right now, this bar is a good option if you have it. So one more specialty bar for you. This is the Cambridge Squat Bar. As we mentioned in the show, either before or after this, can't remember. Um, so right, it's a straight bar up top. This is where the back goes. I'll show you real quick. You pick it up and whack, get set, but you can see the weight is actually held on this part of the bar. So you slide your plates on, and I'll show you the band set up in a minute, but you hold the bar here. So what happens is when you're squatting, this bar has a tendency to shimmy around just a little bit. And as Doug mentions in the show, you also can carry this bar a little lower, it puts a little more load on the hips and lower back. So if you are a good upright Olympic style squatter, close stance, quad dominant, whatever you want to call it. This bar could help shore up some weaknesses. Uh, like I said, it gets a little tricky because this bar floats around. Oh, ow, oh, and the best thing about this bar, if you want to do good mornings, the perfect bar for good mornings. Back type, hinge at the hips, let it rotate down. You can see the bar stays pretty much in the same orientation. It won't roll off my back because it can't. I can hold on to it, keep it locked into my back, squeeze the shoulder blades back. I can hinge at the hip. That bar goes nowhere, and I come up. Yeah, once I, once I uh, started doing good mornings with the Cambridge bar, I never wanted to go back to the straight bar again, just because the whole point of the good morning is to load up the hips, and nothing loads up the hips. I mean, this is going to load up your hips just for squatting, and then, you, and then you throw in that movement of the good morning, and it's just, yeah. it's just way better. If you want to add bands to this bar, what you're going to notice is you don't choke them up here. You're going to have to choke them down here. So the distance means the band's going to be stretched less. So what you want to do is go with a smaller band. <clears throat> For instance, the same mini band. Instead of choking it like this, loop it. So what I'm going to do is just take that loop, stretch it back out. And now I've got a shorter, tighter band. This would be a little too much band tension to throw over the top. But because the band is going to be positioned lower, I can slide it right over against the collar. And now I've got a very good amount of band tension that's very suitable to this bar. And this is, again, for box squats, this is also a very fun, fun, fun way uh, to do that exercise. It's probably a perfect amount of band tension. So, I hope you enjoyed our presentation on bands and specialty bars for this day's Technique Wad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, go to barbellstruck.com and uh, sign up for the newsletter there so that we can inform you of all the cool stuff that we got going on. Peace out. Big ol' head having. <laughs>
You really believe that people just watch it and don't listen to the words? I mean, look at his face. Come on now. My, good point. Yeah. My fault. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Travis. We were <clears throat> when we were at the American Open. Yes. We got in some really good conversation about deep. Yes, it was very deep. We had a good time. Yeah. And you were talking about what the bar taught you about life. Right. Well, you asked me the question. You're like, if I had 45 minutes to deliver exactly what I wanted to, the exact people I wanted to deliver to. you had one to, shot. One shot. And it freaked me out for some reason. <laughs> like, instantly, I'm like, and then I, it just came to me is like, you know, what, you know, the barbell, I really believe teaches us you know who we are like you know are you fearless are you going to go under it? let's say you don't go under it will you try it again you miss it this day will you try it the next day will you just quit like it will teach you who you're about to be you know will you drive thousands of miles away with you know who knows what's going to happen at the end with 200 dollars in your pocket you know it taught me a lot about you know who i was to become and like the business person the, the husband you know the father it taught me all of that yeah so Shit, I forgot I was going to ask. Well, I was going to say also, that <laughs> I think another thing I would say is if when you do get under fiercely and you do have a good lift, that also exposes, because some people, that builds the wrong kind of qualities. They, they take that confidence and they, they start getting a little cocky. They, they abuse the bar, but their relationship starts going the other way. They, they can. They don't really appreciate what it teaches them. You know, th there's a period in my life, too, that where I definitely like let that get to my brain, like, you know, arrogance. And so, but then I think the barbell, you know, I got hurt. So it taught me chill out. You know, you're not that cool. The big, so. the big moment in my life came when I realized, you know, holy shit, I am not in a competition with the barbell because that's stupid. Because the barbell is kind of like the world. I mean, if you want to rise up against it, it will yeah. always be bigger than you. Yeah, it's not there to uh, to be defeated. It's not something you slam and scream at. Right. Necessarily. Not that it's funny to go, yeah, I fucking nail that. And you, you do it respectfully, John. <laughs> yeah, respect, yeah, I, I'm yeah. not saying John is like an asshole for slam bars. Yeah. I'm saying I grew up in a world where the gym was fostering animosity and anger and hyper com com you know, competitive between, like, nature between people and people were as friends. Like, we had to destroy the barbell. We had to talk shit to each other. And I realized yeah. it's one way of doing it. Or you can just realize the barbell is your greatest, your greatest friend and unrelenting. Like, it, it's a teacher that will never leave right. you. It's there. It always calibrates you. It's a calibration tool. It's not something to be defeated because right. you can't defeat it. What, what were you guys saying? You, you talked about as far as like how you lift is like a good indicator of how you are in every aspect yeah. of life. You can tell yeah. like who's like who's kind of wild and who's like very conservative, and yeah, like so it all comes out on the platform. Yeah, when he when he uh, threw that out at me, I actually thought about mine and Doug's lifting styles. Mm -hmm. uh, and even though we were lifting in the same gym, same coach, and we lifted side by side every day, yeah. when we showed up at a competition, our our attempts were very different. So Doug would probably not attempt something in a competition that he hadn't hit in the, in the gym. Right. And I would feel like I left something out on the floor yeah. if I didn't go for a PR. Me too. And so like, you know, for me, like my first lift is like something I can hit in training. Second lift is what I, my best I've ever done. And the third lift is go for broke. Yeah. Like yeah. let's, let's fucking crush something. So like, yeah. Uh, in all I fairness, think, though, was Doug more successful than you, Doug? Well, that's Can you the comment thing. on how many, what, what, what strategy in your view was the best? <laughs> I actually think I, I opened too light. I think it worked against me because yeah. I was super consistent in training all the time. I fucking never missed lifts. Right. Like, if, if it was something that I knew I could hit, I could hit every time. I never, like, accidentally dropped 95%. It wouldn't happen. It, it was either I was hit, trying to hit a PR, and it was 100%, and I would and I would maybe miss it, like, part of the time. And if I went up for 101, you know, I'd, I'd probably get it. Like, if it was, like, right there at the, the, the brink of my ability, then maybe I'd drop it. But if it's 98% or below, no chance I'm dropping it. Oh, but perfect. then in competition, if I get a little nervous and I go, oh, I'm going to open it at, like, 95% or, like, 94%, I, 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 well, throw, I, I, would, I would always throw it over my head, snatching my open arm snatches. Right. I missed that in competition a couple times, like, lifts that I'd never miss in practice. So I think, I think going, opening bum, too bum, light bum, actually bum, worked bum, against me specifically because right. it would. It would be right, too yeah. light and I'd fucking over, over I, pull. I, I think, I mean, you got to just do what's right for you, though. But yeah. that, that tells me, like, so in life, Doug has been a little more methodical and right. conservative, and that's been good for him. And yeah. uh, It's good for you. I've been, it's good for me. He's a business partner and friend so he's he's good for me who's a little more wild and ready yeah. to jump two feet in and want to hit prs in life right yeah, andy's but, more like you too i remember andy yeah he hit a pr on his second lift one time and then he goes i think he hit like a 102 on a snatch something like that andy andy weighs like 155 or so yeah he's a 69 kilo lifter right yeah and so he he hit a pr like 102 or something like that and he goes what do you think i should hit and i was like 
104? And he's like, Put 112 on the bar. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are you he, talking he missed, about? Right? He missed that. He, did, he, he did, did miss it, it but, but that's just Andy's style. He he's, like, he's like, fuck it. it. I'm, I'm going to go big and just yeah. see what happens. Did he Clark it? Did he Clark it? What's that? You know, the, oh, where he, he just made it to the hips. And he, 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 uh, I, don't, I don't remember what happened, but that's when he basically, it, it was actually much closer than I thought yeah. it was going to be. And, and Andy's <laughs> one of the most aggressive athletes I've ever met. Like, yeah. like he, you wouldn't... You, well, you would know if you talked to him in daily life, but he's very professional in a professional environment. But right. as soon as you get him out of that, yeah, mm-hmm. he's a little nutty, man. Me too. Don't take that guy to Vegas unless you want to have a hangover. That's the, for sure. The advantage a, a of that strategy. Partier. The advantage of that strategy <laughs> is you day. go, you go home and tell your buddies, like, "How'd the meet go? Well, yeah, I hit solid opener. Second was good. Went for a big third, but missed it. If I would have made it, though, would have fucking won." Yeah. <laughs> well, you right. go for something you never would have gotten. You know, like I was like I yeah. was always unless the bar you know could potentially hurt me or kill me, yeah. I wasn't even alive. Yeah. Like yeah, I never even took it seriously. It was right, right where, like, in uh, powerlifting, yeah. you know, when the bar was you know, inching close to a thousand, is when I was the most alive, and capable like, of killing you. Yes, sure. yeah. and then and that's what got me going. Like, you know, it's that fear thing. You know, like jumping off a cliff. We talked about, oh yeah, cliff diving or like you know, ju- you know, is. doing, mm-hmm. you know, skydiving. That is yeah. what's not in, uh, in in weightlifting, right? Like weightlifting yeah. is beautiful in so many awesome ways. Right. But I guess that one thing I still like about powerlifting is it's so extreme. It is extreme. Well, you look at weightlifting though. When you when you're throwing 300 plus pounds over your head, if it drops in your head, it could kill you. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I love that. You know, but I remember that feeling. I got a good like, video of that happened to me. I remember that feeling <laughs> with, with two, 289s on YouTube. If you want to hit pop it, around your hit head. me around the top of the head. Awesome. But I remember those days oh, of like. I then I went out and got it. Yeah. I'm in a lit. <laughs> I remember those days like you slam a couple of Fedra because that was the thing to do, man. Fedra. You I remember strap those on days. that squat suit. You strap on the belt. The wraps are tight. Uh, your blood pressure is spiking. You yep. unrack. Anything over 900 pounds, when you, it's just such a different kind of feeling, it man. Is. It's so extreme. And you go on the bottom it. of the hole and your head's going to pop. You stand up and you, you don't even know what happened and you get white lights. It's a certain kind of addiction. I love it. You know, there was a time, it was at 2003 where I was squatting. It was in the nines. And um, on the way down, I felt something rip. And I, and I thought it was just my suit had ripped a little bit. Yeah. No problem. So I went, you know, I got to the bottom of the squat. And went to push up, and I immediately realized that was my leg that had ripped. Yeah. It was my quad that oh, had ripped. Shit. Yeah, and look, it took, mm. I, I'm sure it was only a few <laughs> seconds, but it really seemed like an eternity for them to get, because I mean, th- there was no helping. My you know, my quad was torn. There's too. nowhere to go yeah. when you got that happening. No, dude. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was like 9.30 on my back. And, I mean, uh, oh, so there's no chance of you going up. They had to come save you? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was no push. There's nothing you can no. make. There's, it, no, there's no contractile. <laughs> that's too much weight. Thing happening in your leg. No. You can't like just like you can't just like scoop him back in the rack casually. I thought no. that was gonna be some miraculous story. Where he was like, but I didn't give a shit. I stood up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, no, 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 no chance. I, 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 I was gonna die. <laughs> that's what I meant to say. Yeah, my quad tore off and I still got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. So fuck you. Yeah, exactly. Right. I do what I want, right? So, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it did not. Uh, you know, but it, it. But the next time that I went to that same weight when my leg healed yeah. was just like the best feeling in the world it was like here we go again let's mm-hmm. try this one more time you know what I mean <laughs> like, yeah. it's a f- sick dance we dance it is a sick dance but it, it taught me I'm that way in life like you know I take risks in business you know and uh, I'm, I'm not afraid actually I think but luckily my wife is more like you are you know like mm-hmm. uh, she's conservative so I'll be risky and she'll bring me down and we meet in the middle you know if it were up to me I would be like let's just go big you know yeah chips all in mm-hmm. but she'll be like let's put half the chips in you know what I mean like, <laughs> yeah. fuck I guess we save some of those chips yeah I've, I, I've been I've been like legitimately like injured by a barbell where Doug I mean he did have that one hit his head but like I don't know have you have, had any like major like mess up a knee or a hamstring or or a hip yeah, injury from probably constantly my whole life <laughs> yeah. for like 15 I, I can't remember the last time I wasn't so injured being, in the last 15 years being conservative years. didn't help you out no. <laughs> I, think that's why, I think that's why I was so conservative because I was fucking hurt all the time always always in pain yeah. my friend that I was fighting fits. fighting doesn't help well, I don't know if it was I, barbell I would, I would or say, not but. I would say maybe the fighting is what made road. you hurt and the barbell just compounded that you took a yeah. hard road <laughs> which sport did you like the most not that we're interviewing you but fighting you did. It's the most fun. Yeah. If, if you're winning, it's the most fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, I know, didn't like it. Aside I got from punched the being in the punched in the face yeah. thing, yeah, yeah, that part fucking. Plows. When you got yeah. beat, how was that? Uh, when I, when I got beat, I didn't get beat up. I just lost the fight. Yeah, so, so that's all right. Well, I mean, what? I don't know what all right means, but it, it wasn't fun. It, yeah. it, was, it was depressing, but but I didn't walk out hurt. 
Right. I just, I just, I, I got submitted but and dude, I, I got in a bad spot and and they, he, he was cranking my, my surgery shoulder right. and, you couldn't do and I, I literally almost tapped out before it started hurting. Cause I was like, I do not want another fucking surgery. Right. I almost didn't take that fight. Cause I was, I was hurt, very hurt going in. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. Right. I already got neck pain and shoulder pain, elbow pain and back pain, knee pain. I was like, I, I was, I was fucked up when I started that yeah, fight. That's a bad and decision. Yeah. It, it was, it, I was in a bad spot leading up to that fight. Like I right. wasn't thinking about winning. I was hoping that I wasn't going to go to the hospital afterward. Oh, yeah. And so when, <laughs> that's that's when, the wrong mentality. It was, it, was a, it was a bad yeah. mentality. Whether it be weightlifting or fighting or whatever, yeah. you can't be like that. You can't be like trying to survive it. You know, yeah. That's when you get really hurt. So. Yeah, I almost dropped out twice. My, my shoulder was getting cranked, and I was like, All right, fuck, I, I'm, I'm done for. I'm so done. Have you ever been beaten up? Like big, big time. Um, not really, really bad, but but de- definitely like a little bit all the time. But never, never like hospitalized from getting beat up. I had my, my hip dislocated that one time, but yeah, I, didn't, I didn't, terrible. I didn't feel beat up. That was a very um, but it felt, shocking it felt thing bad. to witness. Jeez. Oh, him. you saw that? Yeah. Well, you, you bounced back. He, from he, it. he was there. He was there. I, I just remember seeing like the after effects and like you did what? Oh, did you ooh. scream? It's when it dude. happened, yeah, yeah, no, I was screaming, I was screaming, stop, 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 because I, I could feel it being <laughs> tore out. I was screaming, stop, 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 and then I, I land on the ground. I was just like, fuck, fetal position, and I, I could, and tell. I couldn't move at all. I couldn't, I couldn't roll my back. Your I couldn't, I couldn't roll shot. over. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I could tell he was. If I was in so by myself pain. in the woods, I probably would have died. Yeah, I could I tell that he was anything. in so much pain that like he was about to pass out. I was like. I was like, I could just tell by the look on his face. I was like, he was it a toss? He's gonna pass out from he pain. A toss or something. He landed on. And, uh, I wonder if yeah. the, your listeners know that they're talking about his hip getting ripped out of joint. Yeah, that's the femur. A, that's the femur coming like out. That's not a common thing. Out of here. That's not yeah. common. No, it usually happens in car accidents. It, can like, take, it takes you so when much force. Yeah. And you get is it car accident or you know trauma incident or under surgery where a surgeon's you know opening up all the tissues, releasing then manually releasing the joint. You're, I mean, right. or like Bo Jackson. I mean, you know what really happened to him? Displays, yeah, displays in, 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 in a in a NFL game. You know, he just yeah. hit, hit perfect, and there goes his hip. Yeah. The strongest oh, guys nasty. in the world running as fast as they could. But yeah, yeah. Like, but like, was he dysplastic? He have a hip dysplasia? Both. He had both um, hips replaced. I think. I don't. I don't know. I, I think I, I work in that sector. I think I remember yeah. hearing that. But God, that guy doesn't have But yeah, anyway. getting to the point where like I got beat up so bad that I got cuts all over my face and two black eyes and whatnot. I definitely had black eyes, busted up nose, stuff like that. But never like so beat up or like. Or like my whole face is just, right. is just destroyed, and you don't have cauliflower ears either. You're still pretty handsome, Doug. I got I got lucky on the cauliflower ears. I wrestled for ten or fifteen years now, and I got I got nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how that doesn't happen. You guys know, uh, know. Randy Couture. I'm yeah. Sure. yeah, so yeah, we're, I, we're I started training. <laughs> I started training MMA at his gym in Oregon. That's how I saw I first. Started. I know him. I met him in Colorado Springs. You yeah. know, he would. You know, he was a, obviously an Olympic, was Olympic caliber wrestler. That's right. You right. know, he was out there, and I met him. This is the great greatest story. And so we go out to this um, bar in Colorado Springs. Uh, mm-hmm. Called the Ritz. Mm-hmm. It's real busy, and uh, he looks like not human. If you, you, yeah. you met him, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah we've met him. Head, we've all met him. Yeah. Like yeah. his head kind of looks like maybe he's not human. Like, you know, like uh, Crow Magnet or something. Right. Mm-hmm. So you yeah, know, we're in there. We're starting to have a few drinks, and I'm like, dude, yeah. show me something. Yeah, that's when he just got in MMA. Like he, right. he was already like on the scene, and like within like maybe a second. Like I was fading out. Like he put oh, me no. yeah, I was like, "Come on, man! You know, show me some stuff." And like he put me some <laughs> kind of he neutralized you. He put me in some kind of headlock, and within seconds, I'm like, I, I knew to tap. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, it just made sense. Oh man, and it's so casual. And yeah. what's really scary is with him. Uh, you realize he's a kind guy. He's just showing me something, and it oh, hurts. Yeah. But if if I made him mad, if I, if he no. needed to attack me, I've stand no chance under no any chance. circumstances. No chance. No. Dude. Under no, no circumstance. I, even if I had a yeah. bat, he's I a big d- guy. He's not small. No. Like when you look at him, he's just like. His yeah, hand. he could just run me over. Yeah. And his, his hands. He's a world class wrestler, big. world class fighter. You think about a guy who's a world class powerlifter. Yeah. Powerlifting against a guy who's never powerlifted before. Right. It, there's no. There's no chance. You can't. You can't compete. Yeah. The strength that they have, the, the, you fighters. I mean, mm-hmm. I know we're kind of going to a different place, but we're going there. like the the yeah. grip strength. The, mm-hmm. str- the, the special strengths that, that fighters have, mm-hmm. I find fascinating. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, do you guys think it can be trained? That that you know when yeah. you, when a wrestler grabs your wrist and it feels like you're going to sna- you know your radius and ulna are going to snap in half. <laughs> what is that? It's the most functional yeah. man strength I know of. Like Actually, grab you and yeah. stop you from a friend. A friend, Doctor Andy Galpin, he's been doing some tests with some UFC fighters. Yeah. at uh, Cal State Fullerton, and uh, with uh, Ryan Parsons, and uh, that's one of the things they're testing. They have like you know they're testing some like cardio type right. uh, tests, and they have like grip strength. But grip strength is one of the big ones. And, you know, some of those guys, he sent us some numbers, and it was phenomenal. 
extremely impressive. And then there was actually a couple guys where I was a little surprised that their numbers weren't bigger. But oh, they, really? But, but they have heavy hands. But, like when but they, they also have, shit, ins- you know? they have like cardio of a, of a Olympic cyclist or something. Right. So it's kind of a, well, the interesting it, thing with some fighters, like like what you're talking yeah. about, like they feel so strong, but then when you put them in the weight room, they don't they don't look weightlifting they're, strong they're or powerlifting okay strong. strong yeah. the but then if you go wrestle with them, they'll, they'll just fucking toss you yeah, around. Yeah, they make oh, you yeah. feel so weak. Like yeah. so, I wonder if like you know if there's any correlation with like grip strength. Mm-hmm. Like oh, the, there I think there is. Yeah, sure. like if someone has this amazing crazy grip strength that no one can explain, mm-hmm. are they more apt to be like a George St. Pierre? Mm-hmm. Or I think they've actually done studies on that specifically on I mean, grip that's strength why and fighting that's success. Why they're, that's why they're testing it. Right. It's because they're trying to help these UFC fighters shore up their weaknesses. So this one guy might have killer cardio, but his grip strength's lacking. So he doesn't really need to go run miles and miles and miles. He needs to work on his grip strength. And, you know, maybe it. maybe do some deadlifts. And then the other guy who has incredible grip strength, you know, he tends to gas out right. fairly quickly. He's like, well, this guy really doesn't need to work yeah, on. This guy loves to deadlift twice a week. This right. guy needs to be out there, well, you know, even, doing some, doing the stair climber or something, you know. Even the fighting, I think you'll learn, like, uh, like who you are. Like, in the, you know, you could even go beyond the barbell. You could be like, um, whatever you compete at. It's like, what kind of, you know, what kind of uh, personality that you display in that sport is, is who you're going to be. And, you know, what you need to do, like, you know, Mike and I, just embrace it and surround mm-hmm. yourself with opposite personalities. And so, like, you know, you're kind of more conservative. Well, perfect. Mm-hmm. Well, operations is going to be your thing. I love it. Mm-hmm. I learned, I think, last in, at the uh, American Open, I learned more that weekend mm-hmm. than probably my entire life from talking to two people. Like, it'd be Mike and it would be talking to Christmas, like Abbott. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it was just phenomenal. And, you know, the conversations that Mike and I had were, like, it made me actually think and rethink Mm-hmm. who I am and like where I want to go and so holy that's shit that's a big yeah. statement <laughs> yeah yeah so but yeah. don't talk to me anybody yeah. it really it's like, a lot of pressure now the t- yeah, I know yeah. but like we were having lunch and um you know I was just like it was cool I knew yeah. he was barbell shrugged and I was just eating and then he started talking you know and I started listening and then before I knew it I had, I was done I put my utensils down yeah. and started listening and we started talking I was done eating God was like this dude has got something to say to the world I think you know and it really you know I mean I, oh god not to be gonna un- but like, look at that smile on his face he's no, like, it, he's like yeah you're right you. you're right we, we all love him <laughs> the way that he thinks and talks mm-hmm. you know the, the way you, he makes you like kind of look deep into you who you are and like you know don't just get caught up in the daily activities of what you're doing like really rethink like who you are where you mm-hmm. want to go you know like is this where you want to be, you know, and that's the yeah. kind of conversations that we had. So yeah, what you want to do in the world, like you're you're always talking about. I mean, this is kind of a, a crazy thing for most people to talk about changing the world, but yes. but that's something you talk about all the time, like providing enough value to the world where you change the world and the way people think, like on a global scale, and that's yes. that's not a normal thing for most regular people. <laughs> Mouth breathers, as, uh, as Chris Moore calls them. <laughs> I, for, uh, I got that from Uncle Henry. Henry Rollins so refers to people as like, "Hey, you're going through someone." There's people, you know, all you hear is the mouth breathing, man. People, some people just don't get it. I'm paraphrasing, but that's uh, a real thing. Like they have nothing to say. Well, yeah, there's like there's people who are. Um, I've come to see it as, you know, in a, in a in a Socratic sense. Sorry to, to throw out a word that makes me sound smart in reference to Socrates. But he I'm said impressed. he's not that come, smart. Socrates folks. is like <laughs> point of view comes down to like your head is above or below the fray. Below you think all the things like which program is the best? Is weightlifting better than CrossFit or vice versa? Uh, politics, red versus blue. All this fucking bullshit right. is all illusion. And sooner or later you wake up and go, I'm just being fucking misled on every front. And all these conversations that are even seem real are completely, you know, sugarcoating and off the fucking deep. They don't really matter. And you lift your head up and go, oh, there's all this world that I see the relationship. Ah. I see how everything ties together. I see how th- the way this song is written that makes it so great, the, the motivation, the passion behind that artist's work is what makes me a better fucking lifter. Everything's connected. See, this makes me want to go hang out with you guys all the time. Like, I see how this <laughs> dynamic works, man. <laughs> yeah, this guy, that was exactly, you yeah. know. When you can look up and say, you know, like society will, will start to lead you a certain way and be like, all right, this yeah. is what you should be shooting for. Like, the the house, the two kids, blah, it's blah, all, blah. Well, the kids are, the kids are great, but the big yeah. house. All, but again, coming <laughs> to a gym like this, this gym... Like it looks in many ways like all the, you know, the, the rugged places where I grew yeah. up piloting stuff, but what's different is the feel. Right. And one thing I, uh, you guys were talking about jujitsu and stuff, but one thing I was coming to, I've been thinking about a lot like of a year or so, is what does jujitsu teach you initially? You go in there raw, 
And what happens? Right. You go, I'm going to fucking wrestle this guy. Yeah. And you go, Ugh, uh, and you struggle. And you, you're holding on to this guy. And you're trying to submit him. And you realize you, you're, you're all of a sudden you're wiped. And you're missing the whole point. This guy is casual, almost like in a way sleepy. Black relaxed, widow in you. And instantly yeah. turns you into nothing. And yeah. I realized, holy shit, man, fucking lifting weights is no different than that. And like, I can be mm. strong as shit. And we can have a good team. We can yep. do that by having fun, encouraging each other, showing that's compassion, key. enjoying ourselves, yep. playing music that's not yelling and screaming. We can have a good fucking time and be a family in here. And that's right. what gets you strong. That is, you know, I think at, you know, Master Elite, that's exactly what we do, man. We, uh, you know, we try to have a really good family atmosphere. We hang out. You know, we don't have like a lot of people like... Um, you know, trying to like battle to see who's the strongest. I joke yeah. around about being the 40 year old that's stronger than everybody. Yeah. But at the end of the day, my total goal is to make everybody here, you know, stronger than me. So I put my numbers in all the ways that you can be strong in all the ways, yeah. you know, not just with barbells, and not just, I know I yeah. want, I want to raise my kids up. Like, you know, yeah. you saw easy, you know, he's walking around the, the, the black guy here. Yeah. Uh, is it? Not that we're, you know, uh, we'd like to get more diversity, but that's how what we have. And so, <laughs> you're, you're in a small town, North Carolina. Small town, North Carolina, and that's what I get. You know? <laughs> so, so, but, um, you know, I want to raise them up right and try not to make the same mistakes. Like, to be a world champion, you do not have to be a jerk to the world. You yeah. do not have to walk around like you're Billy, you know, badass. And you just got to, you know, yeah. what you should do, and this is the point I'm trying to make, is when you get to that, you know, popularity or you're doing really well is like say to yourself now how can I affect the most people in the best way how can I mm -hmm. change the world I look back and when I was winning all those competitions you know I, I was getting hundreds of emails every day like you know how do I get my bench up how do I get my squad up and I had such an opportunity to affect people you know to to make their lives better and all I did was want to stroke my own ego over and over and yeah. over and want to you know I would literally this is terrible I would literally go on the forums just to see what they were saying about me and I wanted to, if there's anything negative I would get super pissed that's you know? the route to suffering man in a very it Buddhist is. sense like you grasping for all that, holding on to that, that uh, not you, all yeah. of us. Yeah. That's where the unhappiness and unsatisfaction it, oh. comes from. And that's what yes. keeps you pushing that shit into your 50 years old. And you go, wow, I don't have hips and shoulders anymore. I Absolutely. ground myself down to nothing over what? Over uh, what? Shitty trophies? Yeah. <laughs> but if you use it to affect lives, it's yeah. awesome. You know, if I were to use the popularity to say, all right, now, don't do these mistakes. Or like here, you know, don't sacrifice your family. Or don't, you know, leave your wife. Or don't neglect your kids. If I had done that, you know, I could have changed lives. But... But you change lives now. Man. I can't. Yeah, I was going to say, is that kind of what you know you're what the, saying the is, track Travis? you're on right yes. now then? That's on what a, I'm doing Travis, now. Travis, on yeah. a hot day, uh, you may have this thought. Uh, if you find yourself without shade, the best time to have planted a tree is 30 years ago. The next best, best time, right fucking now. Right? <laughs> you can do good right now. Right now, man. <laughs> I'm moving to Memphis, man. <laughs> Very long, seriously. So, yeah. So, I mean, that is, um, I guess now we've gone full circle and you see, you know, what it's taught me. It's taught me you know, the good and bad things about me. And it, it makes me aware of, you know, I, when I start to get that old self in me, I try to like, you know, keep it down. You so. do what you want and you want to do good. Right. Yeah, I think, I, I think sometimes if you get those emails about how to get your bench or deadlift up, sometimes it's good to address that direct question that someone wants to answer to. Right. And then give them also an answer they might need. Yes. They, they don't know that they need. And, and that's I think, what I do I now. think that's really yeah. important. Yes. Yeah. I try to really that's answer good all these questions. Like, it's so hard, you know, with, with, you know, podcasting, you know, as you guys know, you get a few people that listen to you and, and want to learn more about things that you talk about. Mm -hmm. So I really do my best to answer all the Twitter and the, and the Facebook and the, you know, the emails that I get. I, and, mm -hmm. you know, not just with some short bull crap answer. Mm -hmm. to va You know what he said the most, too, about, you know, uh, really – empathizing with people and trying to you know mm -hmm. care when I answer a question now instead of just giving them an answer and be like here you go is literally think about what I'm about to say to this human being mm -hmm. and be like you know how can I affect them the most mm -hmm. and so uh, that was the second other th that's the, the mm -hmm. maybe the best thing that he talked about how when he learned about empathizing and he wrote an article and I, I reposted it but um, mm -hmm. about when you really care about what this person thinks and you really try to put yourself in their shoes mm -hmm. well then not only are you changing their lives but you are that's the best way to get what you want out of life too mm -hmm. because uh when you can go to bed at night and be like man i really affected lives mm -hmm. well what else do you want you know yeah so all right so we're gonna wrap this up 
We could what, go uh, on for another five you, fucking I think, hours. I think we could. <laughs> we'll have to do another episode, episode for one. sure. Yeah. Uh, so what do you want to promote? What's your uh, Twitter? What's your website? If people want to learn more about you, where do they go? Um, Twitter, at Mash Elite. My website is MashElitePerformance.com, M-A-S-H. Why do people misspell my name? Mash. Isn't that simple? Yeah, it sounds easy. How do yeah. they, what, what would All you, the how t- else would you spell Marsh, it? Marsh, Nash, Anything but MassElitePerformance.com. And then, M-A-S-H. And then, you know, listen to, if you get a chance, check out Weightlifting Talk. You know, um, I got to plug my man, John North, Attitude Nation. Hell yeah. There you go. All right, guys. See you next time. Cheers, friends. Great time. Yeah, that was perfect. That was great. That was good. Awesome. Well, who, who, like, that's a pearl and nugget laden show, man. Yeah.